Okay, so okay. it just showed up on mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Stop it and start it again. Restart. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining in our, Ju our June um, monthly educational meeting. Um, the two supplements that were highlighted in this month's advertising have been the Total Performance and the Total Performance Plus. Um, but I've just kind of gone a little broader here because I think, you know, over the, uh, the winter, the, sorry, the summer months gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about some topics that we um, don't spend a lot of time on. So I wanted to talk about the nutritional support for the injured horse. And at the end, we'll have also a little recap from the National Animal Supplement Council meeting that Jim and Randy and I went to, and also the equine science meeting that I was at last week. Just a little bit on that. But as far as uh, feeding the sick or injured horse, um, a lot of people think, okay, well, I've had this, you know, very sick horse or he's had some kind of terrible injury and we're going to have to keep him locked in a stall. So we want to feed him a whole lot less because we don't want to get him to be crazy and he's not exercising. Oh, Jesus. So he um, needs a whole lot less nutrition. I think that's one of Everett's customers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so. That's completely opposite, actually, though, because these horses can actually go into a hyper metabolic state where they really need a lot more nutrition. And if they don't get it, animals are really good at getting what they need. If you don't feed it to them, they will suck it out of their, their bones and their body. So um, we'll look at the nutrients used by these injured horses, the nutrient requirements just of maintenance and where I've kind of adjusted them to kind of look at because there are no set requirements for an injured horse, uh, but where I think they actually fit, and then some management and feeding. So there's really many types of injuries, and I'm not just talking about a little, like, stone bruise. I'm talking about a serious injury or disease, so a bone fracture, um, surgery, a uh, severe sickness disease. Body responds um, in the same way to all of these kind of severe injuries. But what we do with these horses, well, we'll stop training them. If they're thoroughbreds or standardbreds, typically they'll be transported back to the farm or a pre-training facility, so taken away from that high-stress, high-calorie uh, environment, and they're given stall rest and typically limited to no turnout. So what we always think of doing is, oh, we've got to cut back the feed because we don't want these horses to kind of be bouncing off the walls and they're not exercising so they don't need nutrition. That pain, you know yourself, when you're in pain, we have a decreased appetite. So these horses have decreased their appetite, they're stressed, they typically from either the disease or the injury have terrible inflammation. This increases their energy demands. And they typically lose weight. So this hypermetabolism that I was talking about can occur where we think, oh, well, they, they need a lot less calories, but actually they have a massive increase in their body's demand for energy because not only are they just maintaining themselves, now they've got to try and heal from that injury. Um, and they can actually go into what we call a catabolic state. That's when the body starts using its own energy to fuel the healing process. Now, you've all heard me say that protein is not the primary source of energy in an animal, but if they've got nothing else to use, if they've used up all their body fat reserves, they've used up all their muscle glycogen, they will start to break down their own tissues and organs to get energy, and they'll get that from protein. Um, and horses become really weak due to this lack of protein. They lose muscle tone. So as I mentioned, this catabolism 
when the animal goes into a catabolic state, it's when they've used up all that glucose, used up all that fat, and they'll start breaking down their tissue. You'll see a lot of um, top line decreasing um, in older horses. If they're not getting enough protein in their diet, they will also have that kind of lack, lack of um, top line. They're wasting, their muscles are wasting away. In these injured horses, it can begin very soon after injury because people aren't quick enough to really give them highly caloric and protein-rich diets. It doesn't mean that they're going to eat a large quantities, as we also, as we saw earlier. Typically, their appetite decreases, so we need to make sure that we're feeding them very concentrated sources of nutrients very good quality protein sources, high calories, things like oil are high calories, but they're also not going to give you all the sugars and starches that a grain would because we, we have a point. We don't want these horses bouncing off the wall, causing extra injury to themselves. So we have to give them energy from sources that is going to be calm energy and it's going to be very concentrated so that we can feed them small amounts because they don't want to eat, but they're also going to get a lot out of it. So we need to use methods to minimize or reverse this catabolism. We don't want the body to break down its own tissues. We don't want them losing. When they lose that body protein, when they're wasting away, it really delays healing. Um, when you can alleviate that pain, give actual medications, and then after the time, the period of medication, um, using and natural anti-inflammatories to alleviate pain because when an animal is in pain they don't want to eat their appetite is really down so if we can alleviate that pain we'll increase their appetite it's not a direct response but it's indirect also obviously to resolve any infection that may be occurring providing adequate high quality nutrition so in this non-stressed or non-injured horse that's not working, most of the calories come from fat stores within the body. A very, very small amount of energy comes from protein. And as we've said, the turning protein into energy is, it uses energy. So it's really energy neutral. When we have that stress or injured horse, 50% of the calorie needs come from stored body fat, and they typically use that pretty quickly, and then these numbers get less and less. Then 20% come from stored carbohydrates, and 30% come from breaking down their own protein, which means their muscles, and then once they look like the horse in the picture and they've used a lot of their own muscles, they're going to go to other organs that contain protein. You know, they're their heart, for example, is a huge muscle. So we really have to avoid that severe protein muscle breakdown because then you'll end up having things like a heart attack. So this energy, this elevated energy requirement is there to fuel that recovery, to feed the animal, give them energy to help them heal elevated protein requirements for a healing muscle and bone. Also trace mineral requirements. Vitamins and minerals have also been shown to be increased in these injured horses. We know copper, zinc, selenium, they're all part of the immune system which is compromised in these injured horses. Um, calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc are also important for bone um, development. So if you've got a horse that's had a severe bone injury, broken bone. As I mentioned, there are no hard and fast data on the energy requirements for sick horses. But if we look at human nutrition and we kind of extrapolate a little bit, a stalled 500 kilogram horse, so an 1100 pound horse with an infect, infection or, you know, after some kind of major insult or surgery, would have energy requirements of about 18 to 22 megacals a day. Well, how does that relate to just a normal maintenance horse? A normal maintenance horse has a requirement of about 15 to 16 megacals a day. So you can see that's really elevated. 
increased protein requirements in sick or debilitated or injured horses because we don't want to have that catabolism. We don't want them breaking down their own tissues. So very quickly, we need to be able to increase their protein requirements. So a 25% increase in protein requirements over the, the NRC's requirement for just maintenance has been suggested for these sick horses. So what does that actually look like? So if I plotted here for our 1,100-pound horse that's stabled, so maintenance, light work, heavy work, or sick. So we've taken this horse from full work, heavy work, and then it's broken a bone or it's had some kind of severe um, disease, infection maybe, blood loss from a severe gash. And we take it back then. So we do have to decrease protein and energy from full work, but not all the way back to where most people take it. Most people take it back all the way to maintenance. But you can see the energy and protein requirements for horses in light work are very similar to horses that are sick. So instead of going all the way back to maintenance, make sure people are still feeding, say, the total performance at that um, at least light work and a light work requirement and energy and protein as well. So we talked a little bit about copper, zinc, selenium. They're involved in tissue generation. If you had a, a huge gash or we've had some kind of surgery, even just a colic surgery, we've got to heal the intestine. We've cut a big hole in it. We've got to heal the muscles in the abdominal wall. Um, those amino acid requirements increase because where does protein come from? Protein synthesis comes from amino acids. Those tiny little amino acids stick together to form proteins, and proteins then go to tissue regeneration and muscle development. Also, omega-3 fatty acids, we know that they're important for immune function. What omega-3 fatty acid supplement do we have? DHA perform, as well as what we're getting out of the oil. It's got the fish oil in it. So we're dealing with this physically fit animal, conditioned to do daily exercise, walk machine, track work. Now it's injured and the exercise stopped. It's very excitable. It's nervous. Perhaps trying something also like the Calm B instead of sedative medication. So when managing them, you know, we, we don't want them to get further injured. So you have to change the calorie sources. We don't want to give them all this extra behavioral energy. So take away the sugars and starches from the diet. These horses have been adapted to eating a lot of sugars and starches because that's what made them go fast. Typically, when we're talking about these animals, we're talking about these cat catastrophic injuries on a track. Um, so we really want to control sugars and starches in the diet. Provide fat, as much fat. The oil, it's 99% fat. Large quantities of oil good quality fiber, your beet pulp, your alfalfa. Alfalfa is high in digestible fiber, but it also gives lots of good quality protein. So we're going to avoid those cereal grains. Add oil. It's got no sugar. It's got also the increased omega-3s. Add beet pulp. It's a highly digestible fiber source. It's also going to encourage these horses to drink water because we're going to wet it as well. Alfalfa, be it hay, cubes, pellets, it really, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and then constant constant access to hay so that we can make sure that these horses don't develop gastric ulcers because they're stuck in a stall. They're stressed because they're used to one type of environment and now we give them a different environment. So we want to make sure that we don't um, exacerbate or cause gastric ulcers and, and decrease that grain. So we want, so a lot of times, endurance horses, thoroughbreds, for example, may have a body condition score of four to four and a half. That may be peak racing condition. We actually want to get that horse a little heavier. So it's kind of like you have to give extra calories to help them heal. We also want to bump up their body weight. 
because a thin horse, it's actually going to harm them um, when they're because they're just using so many calories to heal. So we want to make sure that we've got them at least at a five to a five and a half body condition. As we've said, plenty of hay, beet pulp oil. The buttery is just literally burning up muscle protein. So um, you need to give extra protein than just that maintenance horse. So alfalfa, primary source, four to six pounds of alfalfa at least a day. Um, if you're just doing beet pulp, you may want to also add soybean meal for some extra good quality protein. Um, the trace minerals. So your total performance. Total Performance Plus obviously has the joint supplement in it. The orange, we must ensure that horses are getting recommended amounts and not just, oh, well, let's just give him a half an ounce because um, he's not exercising anymore. If anything, keep him on that two ounces a day. So let's look at this diet. This is typically what a lot of people will do while he's not exercising anymore. We don't want him to get hot in the stall, so we'll cut him back. We'll just give him, you know, he's getting beet pulp, alfalfa, giving him some oil, um, and hay, and you can see that the diet is still severely deficient in phosphorus, copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, and iodine, even vitamin E. Now, from our cup of vitamin E of oil, this is just regular oil, then the vitamin E would be fine. But by adding two ounces of total performance, you can see we can really give more vitamins and minerals. The iodine, if you add a plain white iodized salt block, then that will benefit there. So when you can start to exercise, once we've kind of gotten over that initial injury, slow, calm exercise. Exercise, just like in the young growing horse, stimulates calcium and phosphorus to lay down and build bone. It also stimulates muscle development because we've talked about you can eat all the protein you want, but what stimulates the amino acids to turn into protein to lay down muscle is actually exercise. Exercise also goes to help that reduce that muscle loss. If possible, instead of just keeping them in a small stall, about getting them out to do a little bit of walking in a smaller pen. The other thing that we worry about if they're stuck in a stall is vitamin D. We get vitamin D by having access to the sun. And sunlight will convert and you'll get vitamin D. So we want to make sure that these horses are getting out in the sun so that we don't get vitamin D deficiency because vitamin D deficiency causes a disease called rickets. Well, in humans it causes rickets, but really it messes with calcium and phosphorus absorption. And so then we have more uh, detriment to the bone. If we don't want to be doing a lot of high impact exercise in a walking machine or swimming a horse, if you have access to those things. There are many different types of injuries. The body responds to injuries all the same way. Stress response, inflammation, increased energy demand and weight loss. We want to avoid this hypermetabolism catabolic state where the body begins to break down its own protein. So we need to pro provide enough good quality protein and enough energy. Um, in, and these injured horses, they have an increased energy and protein and, and nutrient requirement. Though we need to minimize that excitable behavior, so cutting out the sugars and starches, Providing our DAC oil, which is primarily canola oil, with some fish oil um, versus the corn oil because the corn oil is going to be high in omega-6 fatty acids. Your beet pulp, hay, alfalfa, your DAC orange, your total performance. Get them a little heavier. And as soon as you can, with veterinary permission, do a little exercise. So before we answer questions there, I just want to go. Um, to a little recap of the NASC meeting. So one of the other requirements to being a member of the National Animal Supplement Council is that Jim and Randy have to attend the annual meeting every year. And this year I was fortunate to go along with them and it was a really neat meeting. Um, and there were a multitude of different 
lectures and seminars, but really one that I took a lot from, and I will actually write a one-page um, white paper that can go into our new dealer packets um, and that you should give to all of your new dealers, and it's really about social media laws. You've heard me say, you know, when I write the labels and I've done the catalog and when I do any marketing material, that I am held to the same standards. You know, NASC has requirements. Um, the American Association of Feed Control Officers, FDA, they all have rules about what you can actually write. And you've got to be very careful about what you write. Um, you know, for example, I can't go with the cool gut. I cannot say cures ulcers. I really can't mention anything about ulcers and have to be talking about foregut and hindgut health. Well, those rules also apply to social media. And social media isn't just Facebook. It's Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter. So, for example, this, this one was quite interesting. A lot of times we have customers that might write, you know, post a picture of their horse. Oh, was feeding it cool gut and it cured its ulcers. As long as we as DAC, and if you are a feed at one of the DAC representatives, i.e. Barbara, Trapper, Andy, or you're a dealer, then you are DAC. So this applies to you. If you like it, then now DAC owns it and we are responsible for everything that's written in that post. So if you see something crazy that one of your customers may have written that is a little bit out there and, and not what you know that we are allowed to write, don't like it, don't comment on it, then we don't have any connection to it. Obviously, behind the scenes, I would prefer you say, hey, can you please refrain from writing such, you know, kind of out there statements about our products. But as long as we don't like it and we don't comment on it, then we will not be held liable for that statement. Now, if you're a DAC dealer or if you're a DAC rep in one of your own Facebook pages and you write something like that, then DAC is liable. And we saw some court cases um, where people had been saying, and it was we were really looking at court cases for you know cosmetics or things, but the same applies where they had written, oh, cures acne or whatever it had, it had done, and they weren't allowed to write that, and their customers were writing those testimonials and they had liked it, and so they then owned that content um, and were kind of giving permission to that content. Also, if you have a sponsored rider or a testimonial from a pro customer that's been given product, they need to, and they write a post on Facebook, they must have the hashtag sponsored written on there. We'd love to have hashtag deck powered, hashtag sponsored, because it's really important that you are transparent and that people know up front that if they're saying, I fed the Dak Bloom and my horse looks fantastic, which is a fine statement to write, but if they have been given any product by Dak, whether they're sponsored or they've been given some to try even, must have, we, we must be transparent about that. So hashtag sponsored. Um... Just last week, then, I was at the equine science meeting, and we have that every two years. Yes, Tina says, can, can it say DAC sponsored? Absolutely. Hashtag DAC sponsored. Perfect. Another way. We can kind of talk about some more options when we go through some questions. But some of the big things. So two years ago, one of the big things that everybody was talking about at equine science was DHA. Well, now that's pretty much commonplace. If you're not feeding DHA or you don't have DHA in your lineup, then you're old school. We have DHA in our cool gut, 
and we have the standalone DHA product. This time, probably the most hot topic was leaky gut and the term microbiome. And they were talking about the microbiome to um, refer to the bacteria that are in the hind gut of the horse. These researchers are really trying to um, look into the bacterial populations in the gut because there are so many um, probiotics and prebiotics and there's a lot of bacteria that people add to products, but we really want to get a better handle on exactly what bacteria are in the gut. But not only that, how they change based on what you're feeding them. If you're feeding a high sugar diet, how quickly does that affect the bacteria, the microbiome, so the population of bacteria in the gut? And how does that then, how does by changing the bacteria, how quickly is it changing? And by changing that bacteria, how is that affecting the rest of the horse? What are those bacteria then doing? Are they producing a lot of excess acid or gas? Are they causing these gastric hind gut ulcers? Also looking at um, fiber length particle size. This comes back to the leaky gut syndrome. So I don't have a picture of it because I'd actually like to probably next month talk a little bit more in detail about this leaky gut syndrome. But if you think about the intestinal wall, there are little things we call villi, which are like finger-like structures that float around on the inside of the intestine and they increase the surface area so that we can absorb nutrients. But down below that, there are these things called tight junctions. And it's really like a gate. And that gate's supposed to be closed. But what happens when we have inflammation or we have really fine particle sizes in the feed, then these inflammation especially can cause these tight junctions or these gates to open a little bit. And stuff is leaking in and out of them. Um, toxins can be leaking out of the intestine and into the bloodstream. Um, they're saying that this leaky gut syndrome may actually be one of the precursors to colic. So a lot of these different types of colic may be actually caused by this leaky gut. So one of the big pushes was also to be able to take blood samples to test for these things that may be leaking into the bloodstream. And based on the blood sample, we may then be able to indicate this horse is going to colic. Or one veterinarian gave a talk and she wanted to be able to develop a blood test because a lot of times we don't know when we take a horse to surgery whether you're just going to be stuck with a bill and a dead horse or you're going to have a big bill because you're always going to have a big bill when you do surgery but you're also going to have a, you know a live horse afterwards and she has coming up with some parameters some guidelines by the doing these blood tests where she may be able to say look going to surgery we're not going to be able to save this horse because he's got too he's too far gone so that then we can just maybe humanely euthanize the horse, not charge, not have to go through surgery with a terrible outcome where we haven't saved the horse, but the customer's still got a $15,000 bill. So um, they were some very interesting things. Uh, another topic or, or one paper in particular looked at rate of intake and digestibility of pelleted feed over extruded feed. And we know that there are several companies that have extruded products. Um, they're much lighter extruded products. There's a lot more air. So if people feed by volume and not by weight, then a lot of times if they were feeding a coffee can of pellets and then they started feeding a coffee can of extruded nuggets, why is my horse losing weight? Well, because now you're feeding a lot more air. There's a lot more air in these extruded products. But actually, this particular study went against the common, you know, the norm where people feel like extruded products might be slightly more digestible and showed actually that these extruded feeds were less digestible than pellets. So there's no reason to feed an extruded feed to your horse. 
There is a new Purina supplement. Um, some of you may have been seeing the um, kind of social media campaign that they're doing. It's called Outlast. It's really just a stomach product. Um, it's a variety of different sources of calcium. Um, one of these types of calcium comes from the ocean. Supposedly it's a little bit more porous. So their concept, their proprietary concept is that it's going to bind acid a little bit more. Um, that acid that's in the stomach that may be causing stomach ulcers. Well, from the research they presented, it was pretty much a bust. Um, they showed a field trial. So our horse, our, you know, the, the trial we did with Barbara was a field trial, obviously. Um, and we saw some very significant improvements in ulcer score to the point that the ulcers were gone. These, they, they tested, they did a field trial on this product with the Budweiser Clydesdales, transported them, did a fit, similar, um, you know, outline that we did. These horses live in Missouri, transported them to Florida. They did a few shows, transported them back, and it was inconclusive. There really wasn't the significant decrease in ulcer score that they wanted to see. So. As I say, with your gastroguard, ulcer guard, which are short term, shouldn't be fed for more than 30 days. Um, after that, you know, the cool gut is very effective. We've seen that in our feed trial, in our trial, but in the Purina trial, they did not see great results. So, in my opinion, it was a bit of a bust. Um, the final presentation, and, and you know, o over the next few months when we do these, I'm, I'm sure I'll be picking out more um, papers to present based on whatever topic we're talking about. But cobalt, a threshold for cobalt in the blood has been added to the FEI banned substance list. It's been bouncing around in the thoroughbred standard bread industry, but the FEI, with the World Equestrian Games next year, um, has been adding some new things and cobalt, a threshold level of 25 nanograms per mil in the plasma of cobalt has been added to the FEI banned substance list. Well, what was interesting was the study looked at differing levels of oral cobalt administration and they were actually trying to look at something else, but this was just kind of a, an indirect outcome that you would need to feed 60 times the cobalt re requirement to get to get anywhere close to this 25 nanograms per mil. So the moral of the story is oral cobalt, unless the horse is eating a whole bucket of straight cobalt, is going to be fine. Where people are going to get into trouble is if they start directly injecting cobalt supplements into the vein of these horses. So, we can unmute, we can type questions. Um, who's got questions? So, yes, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about the sponsored writers, absolutely you can write hashtag DAC sponsored. That would be ideal. I've mute, unmuted everybody. Um, Tanya. Susie wrote, what does cobalt provide the horse? It's a pre precursor to B vitamins. Um, it helps with bone metabolism. It, it functions in a lot of different systems in the body. Trapper, you were going to ask Tanya. a question. Yes. Uh Trace mineral salt versus white iodide salt. How much iodine in the trace mineral salt? Oh, like I don't know how much is going to be in a trace mineral salt. Probably very little iodine. That's why I go with a plain white iodized salt block. Oh, that's what I thought. Like, I, like I think I'm wacky when I 
recommend white iodized salt when you mix it, you know, with milk. I was just when you brought that up, I had to laugh. Yeah. Mute yourself, Trapper. You're whistling to everybody. Other questions? Um, any news on making VHX policy? Nope, no news. And just keep in mind, anytime you add extra processing, the price will go up. I'm not even sure that we can actually pellet it, but we're trying to work that out. Have you heard of Equi Pullman? Yes, I have. And I am actually going to report them to the NASP board and FDA because their labeling is non existent and it's not fair that that company can have terrible labelings. It's not fair to consumers that they can't get the information that they deserve and need from their labels. So, yes, I have heard of them. Tanya, their, their biggest claim to fame on that Equipolman is that it helps with the airway and the heaves and all of that. Um, it's would you? I have no idea how on earth they can make that statement. It's some I, I don't. I don't either, and they're also they're also marketing an oil that is a Himalaya oil that they're saying is the highest in the omegas, um, and that it's a tremendous product. But again, no, there's no labeling that could substantiate that. Exactly. How are you? So are they're you? illegal Good. supplements. Johnny. Okay. Um. What's this question here? Uh, yes, Tina. Tina, why don't you mention that? Okay, am I? Yep, can you yep. hear me now? Yep. Okay. After Back the, um, I didn't attend the NASC seminar, but in discussions with Jim and Randy, we've learned that um, NASC is going to really beef up the amount of fake calls that they're going to be making in regards to making product complaints to see how we handle them. <clears throat> so, as most of you know, at least all of our sales staff should know, whenever there is a complaint that comes in about our product, whatever it is, <clears throat> excuse me, an adverse reaction form needs to be filed with the the office. Um, they are going to be making a lot of calls this year to try to catch us not doing that. So far, I think we've been doing a good job. We don't get that very many of them, but you never know when somebody might say, oh, um, my dog ate a whole bucket of yucca or something silly like that. Does it need to be horse related? It could be animal related, whatever. Anything like that, we need to have an adverse reaction form um, filled out with the office. And I just want to add a little bit because a lot of times the first thing you'll do is email me and say, oh, dog ate this. Is it OK? Or you'll text me. What we need to do is when you email me and the best way to do it is probably email and not text. So we have a document of it. Please copy Jim on it. Even if, because I know some of you have contacted me first, and I make the assumption that you're going to take it up with you and you're going to let him know, and occasionally that hasn't happened, and Jim has gotten, you know, rightfully upset because NASC is NASC needs this. It's a, it's part of our, you know, their requirements. So an easy way around all of this is when you want to ask me the question, hey, is it going to hurt, whatever, this happened, what do we need to do, copy Jim on it. Then we've got a paper trail. I'm helping you, and Jim also knows what's going on. Right, and there is an actual adverse reaction form that all of you have 
that needs to be filled out anytime this happens. And it needs to go to Jim and Tanya. Okay, Nicole uh, wrote, I have a male with allergies. I've been feeding her DHA for three weeks. Oh, don't need to see. <laughs> three. Wrong mute button. Three weeks. At first it seemed to help, but it's back. She's back at coughing and breathing as labored. Uh, 23-year-old quarter horse Morgan Mayer. You know, none of these things are a panacea. You have to also do all the other management strategies. You have to wet the stall down. You have to wet the... Um, wet the hay, wet the feed, turn around. Also, right now, um, you know, we have a, a lot of pollen still flying around in the air. Um, so it's not surprising that it's not completely fixing it. Okay, no other questions? Yeah, it's just I've had a couple of people ask about a vitamin C, just a straight vitamin C product. And why do they want that? It's more towards the FEI horses. Um, Debbie had asked me to ask you guys about that. Um, well, I guess their own vitamin C. So just like they make their own vitamin K and they make their own B vitamins. Now, if you've got a, you know, a stressed horse where the bacteria and the hindgut aren't functioning, that's where you might see a little vitamin C or B vitamins or vitamin K added because those bacteria aren't functioning. But the best way to improve the amount of B vitamins in your horse or improve the amount of vitamin C in your horse is get the gut functioning. So feed the digestive feed additive, the DDA, because that's going to make the gut function. Then they're going to be able to produce those back those um, vitamins themselves as nature intended them to. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, I just I just want to. Suzanne had a question for me yesterday. I had given her a um, comparison on some Equinity products earlier in the year, and she had one of her um, reps wondering, one of her dealers wondering if she could share that with the customer. And I said yes, that she could share that with the customer. But with any of the um, kind of comparisons that I email to individuals, Please don't post them on social media. I kind of muted. To be honest, I haven't seen that anyone's done that. But don't post them on social media because then they can get into the wrong hands. They can be misinterpreted. Um, the whole story Maybe. is not outlined. No formulas have changed. Sorry, I had to mute everybody because there was a conversation going on. So just type. Who who needs to ask a question? Okay, so the truck, I'm sure. we are done, and I'm going to.